This is one of the video series I look forward to each and every week. We are truly blessed to have Millennial Mike go through comments and really bring them out and uh, allow me to react to them. You may not know this about one rental at a time, but I am the only person that looks at the comments. I still reply to every comment. Uh, I will tell you that I don't reply to your replies. That's just too much for me. I will reply that one time. But Millennial Mike does go through the comments and pulls out the ones that he thinks I should go deeper on. And we are just truly blessed to have somebody doing that for us here. So, Mike, what'd you find this week? Yes, yeah, really we got a bunch of good topics to talk about this week, uh, all the way from beginners who want to get started asking, what should I be doing? People talking about dealing with emotional defeat after buying a deal. Interest rate predictions, as always. People always want to know what you think. Uh, people attacking you for downplaying inflation, et cetera. So I figured we might as well start at the beginning, and that's for the person who doesn't own any real estate yet. So this one was from an anonymous, unknown questioner, and they said, I really want to buy my first rental. But with all of the reports that you, Michael Zuber, are talking about daily about the housing market, I'm sitting on the fence waiting for the right time, wondering if there's a housing crash coming or not. On one side, I want to take action and just do it. But on the other side, I don't want to buy my first rental right before a crash. What should I be doing? Well, the good news for this operator and really anybody interested in real estate is it's the same answer. And it's funny. I just had a coaching call yesterday with someone who has a lot of dry powder. It was a number that would impress most people, but, and I gave them the same answer. So let's just say you have a hundred grand and you have zero, but you want to get started. You have a million dollars and you have zero and you want to get started. I give the same advice. Don't do anything as far as writing offers yet. In fact, I don't believe you should be doing that for 90 days, perhaps six months. I believe what you owe yourself is, is to learn your market. Now, I break that down to a buy box. And again, just to tie in the conversation from yesterday, this individual who has lots of capital to deploy was all over the place. They were not, they were like, hey, I have money. I could jump the line. No, it doesn't work that way in my world. Everybody's got to get a buy box. Everybody's got to look at it every day. Everybody's got to learn average. Why yeah. is this important for this, per this anonymous question? What I'm trying to teach you is, yes, you can learn it. Investing in real estate is a skill. There's nothing magical about it. But it does take time and repetition. What you should learn at the end of 90 days or six months is, what is the average return in my focused buy box? Then you can ask yourself, is that return worth it? Let's, be, let's deal with reality. We are in a world today where the risk-free rate of return is 5%. If you are looking at your buy box and it produces four and a half, why bother? But you don't know yet. You've got to do the work. You've got to get a buy box. You've got to join a team. I am telling no one to buy. But I'm also not giving anybody permission to sit on their ass. That's the big difference for me. All the doomers and crash bros want to scare people into inaction, just like this anonymous viewer. And I'm like, that's bullshit. You only could know if sitting down or doing nothing is right after doing the work. And most importantly, back to my conversation yesterday, I don't give a rat's ass if you got a million dollars. You can't cut the line. Stop looking at all these markets. Look at one, build your network, join a team, and get after it. Yes, you can write great deals once you do the work, and maybe you can do two at a time if you have some capital, but you can't skip you know, the work. So that's what I would tell someone. This is about building confidence, consistency in yourself. I am not telling you to buy. I think the crash bros are idiots. I think doom is a huge business. If you want to watch people like that, go nuts. Not my thing. I give you permission to do the work. I beg, I plead. But if you don't want to, if doing the work is hard, go somewhere else. You know, I think it's very interesting. Um, what, so for those of your viewers who may not know my story, I started investing out of state at a distance after I decided that there was more opportunities in the Midwest than there was in crazy Seattle. And one of the things that I justified buying my first rental property for $60,000, a 20% down payment on a $60,000 house is a $12,000 down payment. That means that if I was going to make a mistake, it was going to be a $12,000 mistake versus a several hundred thousand, or in this guy's case, a million dollar mistake. When you have all that money and all that dry powder, you're more susceptible to feeling pain because if you just jump in without doing the work ahead of time, 
it's going to cost you way more than me because you got the money to spend that I didn't. So just a little food for thought for that guy. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's the advice to somebody who's trying to get started and also somebody who may be well along the way. But what about people who just bought their first rental property and it's not going how they anticipated? I feel like I've heard that story before. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've been one, there. <laughs> right. Dealing with emotional defeat. So Kyle Dorn asks how to keep the right mindset when you make a new rental purchase and having additional costs that were not in the spreadsheet, how do you deal with that emotional defeat? Yeah. So uh, again, shout out Kyle for asking this question. And as you correctly highlight, it, it happened to me in my very first rental. So I, I know exactly how this feels. I want to be very clear. I delineate doing the work up until you close on that property. Once you own it, now it's time to learn. So in this case, Kyle bought something and it has some surprise expenses, which again, happened to me. And it's happened to me repeatedly. Your job is to do two things. One is to figure out, are there any lessons in this? Like, should I scope sewer lines? Should I get a roof inspection? Uh, should I should I buy a property without tenants versus assuming, you know, taking over tenants? Sometimes there are lessons to be learned and you just don't repeat those, right? I believe throughout my life and my sales career, that mistakes happen. I actually would tell my sales reps that mistakes are to be celebrated the first time because we get better. The most expensive mistakes are the ones we repeat. So I'm not giving you permission to do it again. I want you to adapt the process so your spreadsheet is better, you're better, you get those inspections. But real estate is, again, I forget what rule it is, one sec. Oh, rule number five, bad things happen. They do. And I don't know what it is about real estate. They seem to happen in threes, right? They just do. So again, I've been there. I know how it feels. I thought I got a great deal. I had to spend some more money. It became a good deal. And then maybe it became a, an average deal. It happens. Don't beat yourself up. Learn the lessons and just keep moving forward. Real estate investing will build wealth long-term. It sucks today. It sucks in the first month. But when you when you zoom out, it's a nit. That Norris Drive property, which almost killed me in the first first uh, rental, uh, has made me millions of dollars because I zoomed out. So I've been there, Kyle. I know how it feels. Learn the lessons, but also don't beat yourself up. Move on. Um, it does get better. Personally, I think that the most important aspect is, again, back to your rule board of bad things happen. You need to manage expectations and you need to have plans in place. So uh, I'm a police officer, but I'm also a SWAT officer. And what the SWAT team does better than anyone else is we plan for contingencies. Mm -hmm. What happens when we roll up at the front door and we take shots on approach? What happens if I get shot? What happens when we're getting shot at? Um, what you know? There's so many different things that can go bad when you go to serve a search warrant or you go to try to make an arrest on the dangerous felony criminal. Um, and so our goal is to plan every single plan for all the eventualities and plan for all the contingencies, assume they're going to happen, take all of our preliminary action as if they're going to happen. And then when we roll up and everybody comes out peacefully and they give up and there's no issue, we're all very pleasantly surprised. But the mindset that you need is one of these bad things are going to happen, as you mentioned. And so be prepared for them. And then when they do happen, you are not going to be caught flat footed and off guard or scared uh, frustrated about what to do moving forward. So my advice is really it comes down to man mindset and managing your expectations. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up long-term. Learn the lesson, move on. Real estate's a long game. Yep. Agreed. Thank you. So Mike, people as usual are interested in what you have to say about interest rate predictions. So mm. uh, Jamie Dimon says rates are going to 10% and Zach Riley <laughs> asks, do you still think rates will be in the fives by the end of this year or early next year? Where are they headed? Yeah, I think rates will be sub 6% by the end of the year. I actually think there's a chance they're sub 6% uh, by the end of August. I don't think they're going. So I've seen some comments about low fives. I've never said that. I think I think they kind of bottom out around 5875. Five. But yeah, I think we're going sub 6. And if the average is sub 6, that means you could probably do a rate buy down into the fours if you yeah. wanted to. Or uh, VA so yeah, loan. I, yeah, I think they're going sub 6, certainly by the end of the year. Uh, I have actually said out loud that I think it could happen by the end of summer, which I, I peg at the end of August. Uh, but we'll see. I think a big, I mean, you'll know, we'll know a lot more June 14th 
or no, June 13th, 13th, uh, when CPI, I expect CPI headline to come in at 4.3 or better. If that happens, you're going to watch rates just roll over. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the question that I have immediately is the Fed has now put us on this torturous journey of slowly raising rates, but at the same time, it's faster than it's ever been in the past, but they've been consistently raising rates over and over and over again. You were famous for saying, just get us from start to finish, just take it all the way. And they wouldn't do it. If they've spent all this time and rates have gotten to where they are now, are you anticipating that the Fed drops rates or just that the, uh, the margin between what the banks are lending at and what the Fed is is just going to shrink. Dude, I love it that you're picking. You would not have been able to ask me that question a year ago. So thank no, you. I learned from you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I just love it when people piece all this together. So I want to be very, very clear. I believe mortgage rates will be sub 6% by the end of the year, possibly the end of August. I do not think the Fed is cutting rates all year. So the only answer is the margin. Right now, the margin is stretched in Lance Lambert, shout out team at Fortune or News Lambert on Twitter, I think the I think it's 323 basis points. Average is 180. So there's plenty of margin to come in, in my opinion. Right. Okay, interesting. All righty. Okay, so uh, this one's a little bit of a spicy comment from a frustrated viewer. Uh, hmm. Stephanie Riz, 5049, says, Mike, you don't think inflation is that bad? Almost two years of 5% or more? You've either been living under a rock or you've been financially free for a while. 70% of people are paycheck to paycheck and will gladly correct you. Inflation has been a huge problem. Your response was, inflation is a nas nasty tax on everyone. You either use it or it runs you over. Do you care to elaborate? Are you taking it too lightly? <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been very clear for a long time that inflation is a regressionary tax. It hurts the people at the bottom. It is horrible. I, I wish it on no one. Um, but what I want, what is fair, doesn't work in real life. I have a shirt that I recreated, I created on the second day of the lockdown, uh, which was 2020, and did a video on it. I'm like, okay, well, I know how this is going. Inflation is going to take off. The Fed's going to print a lot of money, and it even they did more than I expected. I did not think inflation would get to 9%, and it did. But what I knew was coming and have receipts to prove it is inflation would be good if you were owning assets. So if you own assets, especially assets with fixed rate debt that cash flow day one, inflation will increase your net worth. Inflation will increase your passive income. So again, to this person's frustration. Yes, I am financially free. And I don't know, rents are up 30, 30 grand to 35 grand across the portfolio, some stupid number. Mm -hmm. Yes. But again, I am not some guy, you know, sitting here trying to get bigger and, and flex. I'm trying to help other people understand how to get assets and let inflation make them rich. You either use inflation or inflation uses you. And yes, most people, most people, inflation uses, but there are some of us that we use inflation. So I just choose to be on the other side. Everybody can, not everybody will. <clears throat> I think if we extrapolate out from the sentiment that was shared by that viewer, um, it's something that I hear a lot from folks in my generation. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, income inequality is increasing. People are very frustrated because not everybody is getting, as they would see it, an opportunity to take advantage of getting rich because inflation, the barrier to entry is becoming more difficult. What do you think about that dynamic? What would you tell those people? Well, that's a very convenient talk track. And I know your parents may have given you a bunch of eight price trophies and made you feel special, but let me tell you as an adult, life has never been fair. It's never fair. I have people on my channel that did one, some of the following things. So your little soft ass snowflake can be melt away. Somebody I know on this channel sold the big house in Texas and with two kids decided to move into a second four fourplex that they bought. Best financial move they've ever made. This is Anna Kelly. We have somebody on this channel that was $89,000 in debt, made less than 20 bucks an hour with two kids. He decided to create or work in video games and sell video game stuff, which I never really understood, to make side hustle money. Shout out Dion from Dion Talk. We have a ninth grade freaking dropout on this channel telling you how to make it work and go forward. So you can create any soft ass excuse you want. If you don't want it, if you want to bitch and complain like all the doomers, 
Go somewhere else. Block my channel. I don't care. Mm. It is right there for you. My greatest financial mistake was not buying a fourplex when I was 20 years old and could have done it in the Santa Clara County. Todd Baldwin, Spencer Cornelia, you can do it if you want. It takes sacrifice, which I know is a four-letter word to all you eighth grade, eighth place trophy winners. <laughs> I don't care. It just is what it is. You can either suck it up and sacrifice for five to ten years, or you can keep on complaining and let inflation use you. I don't care. It's your choice. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I think that what people forget is if they look to the past and say, here's what worked for people before, oh, it's not working right now, all is lost. Well, look, man, there's going to be new solutions and there's going to be new avenues that you can take. People didn't talk about house hacking to the degree that they talk about it now 25 years ago. It wasn't that it wasn't possible yeah. to do. It just wasn't as popular. Yeah. So let me just tell you, again, a hard truth for my life. So I was married at 19, 19, brand new 19. I was a puppy, right? I had three freaking jobs. I was selling my life one hour at a time. I worked seven days a week for three and a half years other than Thanksgiving and Christmas. It was because the, everybody was close. I had two days off a year because that's all we had. Today, I could do side hustles on this stupid device and work from home and make a killing. I was making like five bucks an hour. So if you want to be an eighth grade place trophy winner and bitch about having a thousand dollar iPhone and high speed internet, you're just a whiny little bitch. I don't get it. <laughs> Mike's getting hot today. It's getting hot. <laughs> no excuses. All right, Mike. Okay. Banks actions translated. You're really good at telling us and reading in between the lines between what banks are doing. So uh, Christopher Salinas 2328 asks, what do banks tightening in a downturn say about their previous years of lending? Your response was, it says they're concerned. But can you elaborate? If a specific <laughs> bank is tightening their lending, does that immediately mean they're in trouble? What does it say about them? Yeah, no. So it doesn't mean they're in trouble at all. It could mean they're in trouble, but it's not, doesn't mean. It basically means they want to conserve cash. That's what it means. And again, I've, I've been warning, and actually I did a keynote presentation in Fresno for 20 minutes, and I let people know today that lending on a scale of 1 to 10 is a 4, and it's going to 9. Like We haven't seen anything yet. It's going to get bad. Uh, and it's because, because banks want to conserve cash. And yes, that is because of bad loans and because of bad assets and all of that. Uh, it's going to get worse, and it really just means they want to raise cash. Interesting. Um, okay, I'm glad you brought up the Fresno event that you did because the very next question I have was in that event, at least I think you're referencing that event where you were giving a main stage presentation. You talked about being the small fish. Oh yeah. Uh, you said that you were the small fish in a room full of people with 50 million to a hundred million dollar net worths. So my question for you is what were your questions for them? What did you want to learn and what was your best takeaway? So, um, I think I've been pretty clear on my channel. There are two things that I need to answer for myself in the next year or so, right? I believe real estate investing is you're, you're never done learning. You're never done growing. You're all of that. So one of the things, two things I've identified. One was this event. Olivia and I are fine, but I've always asked myself, do I want to get bigger? Do I want to do bigger things? So I spent thousands of dollars going to an event in Vegas, sitting in the room, being the small fish. And I can tell you right now that my answer to that was I have no interest in being them. Hmm. Right. I've gotten to a point. I've sat down. I'm enjoying the view. I'm comfortable. I'm not telling you I will never get up and keep climbing. I'm just comfortable now. That's what I had to answer for myself. That's what Olivia and I have answered. We talk all the time about this stuff. We see others out there doing other things. And we're like, should we? Shouldn't we? Eh. So this event was about that. I have no interest in doing that. We're, 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 we're going to do bigger things, but it'll be our bigger things. We're not going to raise capital. We're not going to pull this. We're not going to do that. So that's really where I wanted to go. The other thing, just to close it out, is creative financing. I need to figure out other ways of doing this, working with Ty, who's another millionaire contributor, maybe go to a PACE event if I, if I want to. But uh, you know, I, I'm not done learning, and I'm spending money investing in myself on that. So that was what I learned is I don't want that. And that, to me... Spending, I don't know what it was, 3000 bucks or whatever to know that I don't want to do it. 
money well spent. Now I can stop letting that take up my share. So all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad that you brought up uh, Pace Morby because for those of you who don't know, not only do we react to questions from commenters, but people send us a ton of videos to react to. So we've got a bunch of videos, one of them being an interview with Grant Cardone and Pace Morby that are coming up next in future segments. Two uh -huh. more questions left to go, Mike. Uh, okay, so home, home price is rising again, yay or nay. Steve Lassane, 117, my favorite number, asks... <laughs> Do you think that since transactions and sellers are taking their houses off the market, which means less inventory, do you think that prices will start rising again? Uh, and your response was, it'll be interesting if 7% reduces, 7% interest rate reduces listings further. Not yet, but I'm watching. Yeah. So, you know, everybody wants a crash or a boom. I actually, again, go back to my call from January 2nd, 2023. I think, I think prices will be relatively flat, you know, plus or minus 1%. Uh, I think basically what happened to break down the 2020s is we had we had all the decade of appreciation in the first two years, and now it's going to be a rather boring national market. That doesn't mean localized cities or localized buy boxes don't have acute pain, i.e. Austin, Texas. It doesn't mean they have acute pain like Phoenix and then surprise people and come back because the iBuyers left. You've got to know your area. I know Fresno, California. I know the Bay Area fairly well. And then I know nations. I don't know Miami. I don't know, you know, Chicago. I don't know Seattle. But uh, yeah, I think the nation's going to be rather boring for the next couple of years. Interesting. Interesting. Um, last question that I have for you. We recently, you, myself, the Lumberjack and Dion did a four-person event, mm -hmm. um, REI Avengers event. Yeah, and one nice. of the questions in there was from Nohi. And he asked a question I think a lot of people are feeling the frustration with. He expressed, and this is an amalgam, I just put it together because I didn't have his actual question. Uh, he said that he had been looking at his market for well over a year. He was running deals. Nothing even comes close to positive cash flow. Yeah. Everything is losing money. He's in a tough California market. He says, when do you start drawing circles or considering alternative markets? When is it okay for you to say, all right, I want to look elsewhere? Yeah, I, I love that question. And that is one I've been thinking a lot about because, again, I go back to our story. So first off, if you are being disciplined, like I know he is, mm -hmm. right, daily looking, writing great deals or good deals, and it hasn't worked for six months, that's when you could start. That's when I would start drawing circles. And that's what we did. And we found Fresno. If you do that and you get to a year, to me, that's when you might have to go out of state uh, or at least out of area farther than you're comfortable driving. That's kind of where I'm getting to this. And that's why I love talking to you because that's what you did. I still think too many people go, Hey, it doesn't work. You know, on my street, I'm going out of state. Mm -hmm. I think out of area is a far safer. Like I could not have, like I went to Fresno twice a month for almost three years. I couldn't do that out of state. It would be cost prohibitive. And that's maybe I me. maybe I'm, broken. I'm not baby. I'm certainly broken, but um, I just think out of area doesn't get enough love. So the first thing I would say, if, if you're really doing what I prescribe and I know, no, he is six months is the time because by then, you know, the market, you've taken some shots, you're losing or, or not winning. Then you go out. And if that doesn't work for another six months, then I go out of state. And I don't know that I would have said that before the event, that, hmm. that event, listening to you, listen to the audience, watching you go deep for three hours. that That's now what I believe. I, I guarantee you before that event, I would have been out of state is wrong for most people. I now will say local for six, you know, by, you know, local for six, then out of area, then out of state. So you changed my mind. So good for you. Well, it is, it is a very uh, tempting idea. And I still agree with you. Uh, you want to make sure that you exhaust opportunities in your local area first, because there are certain difficulties and challenges when it comes to investing at a distance, but there's also unique opportunities. Most people, the reason they become interested in it is because they just see somebody list a house for 70,000 and they think, oh, this must be a great deal. Probably not. In fact, in most cases, almost certainly not, but you can take advantage of it. Uh, Mike, we got a bunch of videos to react to. Again, Grant Cardone, Pace Mo Morby, Cody Sanchez, Ken McElroy. So stay tuned for those videos. That's all I got for you for the questions. Mike, I'm still amazed that you do this for the audience each week. Folks, do me a favor. Leave a comment below thanking Mike for doing this. And if you want Mike to ask me a question, 
just put it below. Say, Mike, ask Mike this question. I'm sure he will get that and bring it on the channel. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate you.